Hello and welcome to the World Extreme Medicine Podcast. I'm your host today, Stephen Wood, and we are lucky to uh, be joined today by Will Mackin. Uh, Will is a retired naval officer. Uh, he is currently a fellow in the Harvard Radcliffe Institute uh, in the Arts and Humanity programs, uh, and he's an award-winning author. Uh, his uh, first book um, was titled Bring Out the Dog, uh, which explored his experience um, in deployment in both Iraq and Iran. And he uh, basically brought together a compendium of, of different short stories and integrated some poetry to describe um, you know, those experiences. Uh, his newest work is what brought him to our World Extreme Medicine podcast today, which is currently uh, uh, titled Animals. Uh, and it is, again, a compendium of short stories about his experience in deployment uh, and his encounters with animals. Um, so welcome, Will. Uh, thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you, Stephen, for having me. It's a pleasure. Yeah, it's great. You know, so I, I thought about this podcast. I was thinking about, you know, I was, I was reading about your work um, and I was thinking about, you know, most of us who are involved in um, wilderness medicine, expedition medicine, or even people who just, you know, go hiking, go kayaking, have had some sort of encounter with animals. And sometimes that's planned. Um, we might go on a whale watch or we might go, you know, kayaking with the hopes of seeing um, some seals, although I live in you know New England, and right now seeing seals means you're probably going to be attacked by a great white shark, although quite <laughs> rare, in honesty. Um, or you know we might go try to you know see uh, different fauna, birds, um, reptiles, things of that nature. Um, you know some of those encounters are negative. Um, you know you might encounter uh, a bear. Uh, you might encounter um, other you know animals that. Um, you wouldn't want to uh, tangle with, you know, I think having thought about your military experience, you know, the first thing that came to mind to me was Apocalypse Now, and I just still have that memory, and I'm not even sure I'm recalling it correctly, but, you know, they're walking through the woods and, you know, they encounter this, like, tiger, uh, mm -hmm. and it was such a visceral and kind of most frightening scene to me, because at least, you know, you're, you know that your enemy, you know, uh, is out there in the woods, but, you know, that's something that's kind of unexpected that you're going to maybe be mauled to death by a tiger. Um, I have to admit, I don't know the fauna of Iraq and Afghanistan. I don't think there are tigers there. So maybe that wasn't a concern of yours. Um, but uh, it was just something that always stuck with me. And it's kind of, you know, what I wanted to, to chat about today was just, you know, your experience um, with encounters during these deployments um, how, how they're managed in your setting, and then we'll explore a little bit more about how you bring these stories into your artistic realm. So I'm going to give it to you. I, I'll ask, you know, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, what was the onus for wanting to write this piece? And, and I know, you know, animals are tied throughout your other work as well. So what was it that brought you to, to write this piece? And, and maybe we can then explore some of your experiences as well. Oh, sure. Um, so... As far as tigers in Iraq, that, that stuck with me for a sec because there was a early story when we went over there, um, and I forget what year it was, but it was relatively early. It was before Saddam was captured, and the rumor was that he had a bunch of tigers and lions in this particular palace of his, and that when it was liberated by the locals, by the Iraqis, they released all of them. And, and there is um, there's a graphic novel a guy wrote about the lions of Baghdad, particularly like centered around this myth. And um, anyway, it was active when I went over there. I love that, that book. I wish I could remember the guy's name, but it's called Lions of Baghdad. It's a graphic novel, an incredible book. Um, but there was, there were, well, there were myths like that about, Saddam, that he was a hunter, a big game hunter. Um, and beyond that, um, the country was, I mean, we saw goats probably every night, dogs, uh, wild dogs were, were all over the place. Um, and uh, particularly out in the desert, we'd go on these long walks in and out of Target because we wanted the element of surprise. So nighttime, 
you ride helicopters to a point that was just out in the middle of nowhere. And then from there, walk into a city and make our way to where we were going. And, and along the way, we'd run into most often dogs. Uh, in Afghanistan, it was goats and um, dogs as well. Um, there was another story that kind of stuck with me that kind of got, it was really the first one I wrote that, um, that went to the subject of animals, but it was kind of tangential. Um, the, the animal was a cobra. And so um, there was another story, kind of, kind of a myth, again, where uh, a, a team of ours, a SEAL team, a sister team, not, our, not the team I was on, but another one, had gone to this outpost that had been uh, shut down for a while. So it had been four or five months. Nobody had lived there. All the bee huts, which were these plywood huts, were locked up. And so they arrived and they had to like open everything up. And while they were doing that, uh, somebody turned over a, a metal trash can. They like flipped it over. And, and when, they, when they did that, there was a big king cobra. This is like in the the mountains between Afghanistan and Pakistan, pretty high elevation. And so this uh, King Cobra like stood up and, you know, started to hiss and like lunge at him. And um, seals being seals, they wanted to, uh, to like play with it. <laughs> and, yeah. and the, the guy who was the boss of the team, the, the commander, wanted them to get to work because they had a mission to run that night. And, you know, they had so much stuff to do before the sun went down. And so he went into the toolbox and he got a sledgehammer and he walked over, like split up the group that was taunting this Cobra and he swung the sledgehammer, hit the Cobra in the head and then smashed against the wall behind it and smashed, killed the Cobra with one blow of a sledgehammer, which the only confirmed kill of sledgehammer as far as I know, but it was that story repeated itself. Like I heard different characters involved with, who uncovered the Cobra, who killed the Cobra. And, um, and that was just within the SEAL team. And then even later, I was waiting in line at a USO after I'd retired and I was traveling. And I heard two of the soldiers that were in there telling the story, like one guy telling it to his friend, like, yeah, I was there and it was my boy, Fred. And um, so anyway, it's just how really like the thing that, got into my imagination then was like how the story had resonated and kind of changed shape a little bit and who knows what the what actually happened initially but right. the cobra itself like i wrote many different drafts and it's still not where i want it to be but <clears throat> that that kind of got me into that thinking in that mode and all the other encounters that we had as well yeah and i'm i'm assuming that um reacting to a, a Cobra attack is not part of standard SEAL training. Um, do you guys no. get training? And yeah, do you, uh, is there training on, um, you know, what to do with in certain encounters, for instance, wild dogs doesn't seem like something I would necessarily be thinking about, you know, as a, as a soldier on a deployment or, you know, someone on an expedition. Um, but they are, they are things that actually you'll encounter in humanitarian response um, you know, during expeditions, do you have specific training in that area? Do they have, you know, kind of protocol around, uh, you know, that? Not really. I mean, if it was, if it was a matter of um, maintaining the element of surprise, then they would usually shoot them. And so that was, I mean, you know, suppressed rifles. And so it was still not quiet, but uh, somebody had to make the call whether or not it was, uh, if it, if it was a threat to the mission. Um, but other than that, I mean, most of the time we just let them bark, they would get bored with us and they'd walk off and go do whatever they were doing uh, before. But um, no, there's no specific training. There's no specific protocol as far as I can remember. I mean, we had, we had our hands full with the, the people well enough and just trying to figure out how to operate in the mission was, you know, half the time it's hearts and minds, half the time it's, hunting down people that were the high value targets. And so, um, yeah, quite a bit of thought put into that and, uh, not as much probably into how we were going to handle it. I mean, we just, the, I told you the story about when one particular raid, there was a bull that was asleep, like in the, um, 
it, there was a courtyard and rooms off the courtyard. The bull was in the courtyard and out cold. And, you know, we came in quietly and it was a guy who had grown up on a farm who kind of advised us like where to step, where not to step and how, how to, uh, how to treat it. Basically just let it be, you know, let it sleep and, and be as quiet as possible. Yeah, no, I, I think that's interesting. And I, I also, you know, it, it brings just to mind and, you know, obviously in the military setting, you know, violence is certainly um, part of the culture. You know, what, what do you think? And this may not, you know, this may not be something you've put a great deal of thought in. Maybe you have, but, you know, what are your thoughts on how do you think soldiers relate to, you know, people's um, animals? I mean, even you're probably encountering even people's personal pets, Mm -hmm. um you know you're, you're encountering as you mentioned even maybe some exotic uh animals you know what mm -hmm. do you think kind of the general culture around handling that is you know um everyone values life um mm -hmm. you know and especially people that are in the field of expedition medicine you know we certainly value our lives but many people are uh you know conversation uh yeah uh conservationists and um you know really have a respect for wildlife do you feel that maybe you know, that carries over in the military or do you feel that that maybe that comes to head? You, you know, I, I assume that you probably have some feelings or have written about that kind of topic. I'm curious, you know, what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, I think, I think it does carry over. A lot of guys are hunters and so they look at it through that lens as well. Um, but there was one mission in particular, we were in a, um, walking through or, or basically just kind of clearing a, a valley in Afghanistan. And um, there were, strangely, there were a lot of birds in cages. And, and um, I wrote one story about it and I called it an emperor pigeon. That's, that's what it looked like. It was just a really, really big pigeon. And um, we had a couple Afghani um, army members with us. It was a sort of an exchange type deal and they were doing translating. Um, when we finished with the last compound, we weren't reading. We were just going, we were talking to the people and saying, Hey, have you seen these people? Do you mind if we search the house, that type of thing? So it was what was called a soft knock, just a presence mission. Um, and so we, we finished that no drama really, as we were leaving one of the, uh, Afghani guys, um, from underneath his armor, there's this little bird head pops up and it was one of the emperor pigeons. He had taken it from the, the last house. And I remember the guy that, that, uh, we were with or the, the, um, the lead guy said like, no, you got to take that back right now. We were about a mile away. And he said, that's their li livelihood or part of it. At least right. they get eggs from something. We don't know, but you can't take it. So we had to go back and he had to return the bird to them. So there is, I mean, nobody likes shooting dogs. I don't think, I mean, some people took probably pleasure in that. They were just pent up frustration or whatever, but the, um, as far as like pets, uh, there were rabbits. I remember people kept rabbits. They kept goats. Of course they, they had, uh, dogs that were, that were pets as well as like our working dogs. And so the, um, there was, there was some effort. It wasn't just indiscriminate, but there was definitely some effort in not harming things, people, animals, anything that we didn't have to. Um, right. So, so there, there was always that, but as, but with the animal side of it, I mean, there was sometimes a little bit more of a, uh, not a predatory thing on our part, but guys looked at it through kind of a hunting lens. So if it was, say like an elk or I don't know, whatever the equivalent is, I'm not a hunter, but you know, deer or something like that, they would talk about it in hunting terms. Like, yeah, sure. Sure. Yeah. No, absolutely. Mm -hmm. What was it about your experience, you know, during these deployments with these animals that, you know, drew this into your artistic realm? Where did you get the idea for your book? And, and what was it that, you know, what was that experience you know, for you that really made you kind of want to write about this piece? Because I think, you know, I, I granted it's, you know, you're talking about, you know, your uh, military experience and your, these encounters. Um, but I think, you know, it also draws upon, as I mentioned, the, you know, conservationist thoughts around animal encounters. And also people, you know, there are entire pro TV programs about people getting, 
you know, attacked by sharks, attacked by bears. I think there's just this kind of, you know, interest in, um, you know, how people interact with animals in these environments. What was it that drew you to kind of, you know, take these stories and meld them together into uh, to your book? Well, I think um, the cobra story was one thing in particular, yeah. just because it was it, it was just circumstantial, really, that it centered around a cobra. But um, I started to think like how that story resonated, how I heard it over over and over again, different different people, and um, it just got me thinking about like what are the components of a story itself, how it can be transferred from one thing to another, but the central aspect was always the Cobra. So that was kind of the impetus. And then uh, it, another um, encounter that was pretty affecting was the, the live tissue training. And so that was mm -hmm. um, like a trailer full of pigs uh, brought up from, and we were in Virginia at the time, so it was a farm in like North Carolina. The guys who ran the farm were veterans and they were all wounded veterans. And so they, um, prior to giving the training, talking through like what we were going to do, they, they gave us this, uh, this talk. It wasn't really a lecture, but they did kind of say like, look, you know, this is, we're not here to joke around. We're not here to, um, to play with these animals. We're here there. They are sacrificing themselves so we can learn and we can save each other. And it was, it was, um, I mean, we'd all kind of been in situations like that. And so it was a very somber um, event, right? And so, uh, and also just hands on gory as you would expect. I mean, I'm sure that you and your listeners have experienced things like this, um, but that was kind of our, our window into it, our practice of like how no, nobody, there were medics in the group but they weren't there for the training. It was for the layman, like myself, that, that never really uh, took a class like that. Maybe the last thing we did was like sixth grade dissection of a frog, right? And so these are the parts. This is what it looks like when it's live. This is, you know, how you, um, I forget what they call those little clamps, but how you put that on a, on like an artery or a vein or, you know, to stop the bleeding. Here's how you use the, um, the quick clot, which is like that, you, it would look like pop rocks and you pour it on the wound and it kind of cauterizes it. Um, so, I mean, we learned all that, the tourniquet, the, uh, how to dress a wound, how to keep these pigs alive for as long as we could, you know? And so the, the very last thing that my instructor did for me is like, he had me reach in and hold on to the heart as the heart was beating, as the pig was dying and feel like the thump, you know, how it kind of gets weaker and weaker, but it's still there and you can feel it until it stops. And so that was, that is another story that rather than just factually write it, it, it seems to come at me at a, at a funny angle, not, not just the way I told you, but it, it obviously has repercussions in um, for humans as well. And so the, the link there really between like the, the sacrifice of the pigs and kind of what the instructor told us initially, like this is, you know, we need to, we need to take this seriously. We need to um, you, use, use the pigs for as much as we can, because they are, um, they're here to teach us basically. And so that, that was another one um, that really hit home. And, uh, and just beyond that, just thinking about like all of the encounters and it seems it's something that it could be easily overlooked or just taken as like, I don't know, just part of the scenery, but it did seem there were times like the bird when, when we had to walk back and give the bird back and uh, <laughs> um, <Yeah. clears throat> other times like the, uh, there was one night where um, we had a, uh, uh, it was an attack in a field by like a AC-130 and AC-130 used a howitzer basically flying howitzer. And so it's shooting 105 rounds with airburst fuses. So the frag is just like ripping this group apart. And, and they were hiding in a, in a uh, herd of cattle. And so they're just like the, the parts all mixed. And I mean, you can imagine it's just, that's another one that, uh, I mean, I could just, I think of so many of them. It just seemed like, okay, I got to figure out a way 
to put all these together. Yeah, I mean, they're really kind of unintended, unintended casualties of these war, of this war, mm -hmm. of these wars. And yeah, it's, I'm, I'm sure it's, you know, obviously human life has a great deal of value. And I'm, I'm sure it's really difficult to see you know, those animal lives in that, in that experience as well. And um, yeah, going back to, your, you know, you were talking about the live tissue. That's something um, that here, at least in the United States, we did ATLS training um, mm -hmm. and we would do the same kind of live tissue. Mm -hmm. um, and they used a variety of different animals and some of, sometimes they used, uh, goats, sometimes they used pigs, but sometimes they used German shepherds. Um, mm -hmm. and I know a lot of people would walk into the room and they would just be in shock that they were, you know, there's no way they were going to be able to, you know, do that lab and, and yeah. people would drop out as well. Um, right. and, but the most memorable one for me though, is we would do this live tissue lab to learn how to intubate neonates, little small babies. Mm -hmm. And they use ferrets. And I'd intubated a lot of babies at that time. Yeah. Um, and none of them had the fangs that ferrets have. Um, <laughs> you'd be, yep. and it, they would keep them alive. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, you'd intubate them and then they'd wake them back up. And the, the ferrets would be pretty pissed off at you as well. Because they're like, yeah. you put me to sleep, shoved a tube down my throat four, three or four times. And now you're going to, now we're going to try to be friends. Um, no, friends it was an yeah. interesting experience, but certainly no, I think, you know, a lot of people in medicine really struggle with, you know, kind of the use of live animal tissue for these kind of things, yeah. but you know, the alternatives and there's a lot, you know, coming out um, for simulation, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, where we'll use mannequins and things of that nature, but really the, the experience that you do get, um, and the, the thing that stuck with me, what you just talked about the most, where you're putting your hand on that heart and feeling that beating heart. I don't think there's any way more, more, uh, it, I don't think there's any better way to actually have respect for that animal and that, that life when you're feeling that, you know, that organ just beating in your hand. Um, mm -hmm. I know it's, you know, kind of, uh, sounds a little, uh, you know, uh, gross, um, but, you just, you, you, you get to connect with that animal in some way. Yeah. I'm not a huge fan again of, of live tissue labs anymore. Um, you mm -hmm. know, I went through many, um, you know, I, I, I do think there are lots of different alternatives that we can be using. Um, but it is a, it is a kind of life changing experience to feel that um, even more so when you've done it on a human. And if you've ever had your, you know, hand in a chest after someone's had a, you know, they've opened their chest because of a bullet wound or in something of that nature. It's, it's probably the most intimate experience you can have. And, and I can yeah. see how that would really draw you in to want to, you know, kind of talk artistically and creatively about those experiences. And it's, mm -hmm. it's great that, you know, I've not read, you know, anything like what, you know, you wrote in uh, bring out the dog um, mm -hmm. uh, about those kind of experiences. And I'm sure animals will similarly be, you know, a great book. And it's talking about those visual experiences. I hope. Yeah. I mean, you could have a bomb. Who knows, right? You, could be, you win the award and kind of like slack I know, off a little I'm, bit. I'm due. Yeah. Due for a bomb. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> How long is the fellowship? Do you have like at least a little time to? to yeah, it's been great. It started in August and it's ending next month. Great. So yeah. uh, a good 10 months. Yeah, just solid. Yeah, at home. a good 10 months of solid getting, being yeah, able it's to work been on wonderful. it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the other, uh, you know, you also talk about animals in your first book. Um, and uh, so is, is there a link for you for that? Did you have, uh, you know, what would, was, was there just, uh, do you have, did you have a lot of pets growing up? Did you, do you have a love of animals? What was, you seem to, you know, kind of really um, weave those into your stories. They have a really kind of central role. And I think, you know, it, does it, it speaks to something about, you know, kind of your past, your background. Do you think there's something there to that? Or do you think it's just, just the frequency? Well, I mean, no, I mean, that, that's a really good question. Now that I think about it, um, my first story that I was published that I had published was called uh, Catacopen, which is cat heads mm -hmm. in, uh, in Dutch. And that it was about candy, but um, they were shaped like cat heads. And the, the title of the book comes from a story about a, a military working dog, so one of our own dogs that we lost, based on a true event. Um, yeah, and so like, and the bird that I told you about kind of worked its way in as well. 
I don't, I don't know. I mean, I don't intentionally go. I'll tell you what, I think what it, what it was initially was kind of a easy way to establish some emotional stakes. And, yeah. and that sounds kind of technical, but really for, for me as a writer, I, and I, and it, it definitely affected me that way. And so if it doesn't, if it doesn't, you know, create some emotion in me, I'm not going to be able to um, create that in the story. So I think right. I would, I mean, I know some writers probably can do that, but these were my first stories. And so I was like, well, I need, at least need that touchstone. And so those were examples of, of when that happened. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I've always had pets, cats and dogs, and um, we've got one now that uh, they, they always have a bunch of different names and uh, our dog, that I went running with this morning. Uh, I live in New Mexico. We go on this trail by um, the Rio Grande, and uh, some coyotes came out today, this morning. Stood out in front of the on the path in front of us, and he tore off after one of them. And I couldn't I couldn't get him back. Like the coyote, it looked like a setup to me because the coyote like looked at him from the trail and then dipped back underneath into the. Uh, it's called the Bosque. It's like a low area right next to the river it's really um, covered in trees, beautiful, beautiful area. But anyway, the coyote dipped into that and uh, I could see there were others kind of waiting down there. So it looked to me like a trap. And, you know, I tried to, I freaked out a little bit because I thought like, Oh no, I'm going to lose him. You know, my, yeah. uh, my, uh, anyway, um, he, he wound up turning around and coming back. She's a good dog. And I leashed. That's good. The They're smart creatures. I, I used to work as a med flight helicopter medic, and uh, we're, you know, we actually have coyotes here in New England now. They, they're, they weren't here before, but they've moved in. Um, and yeah. we used to land at night in this, in this airport. And when the Arctic sun, which is our, you know, light for landing would come on, you'd see them kind of like all waiting there. Um, and mm -hmm. I'm like, there's no way I'm getting out of this helicopter. And that, I think that was the most... <laughs> It was the most exercise I, I got during that time frame. I would just run as fast as possible from the helicopter into our uh, to our quarters because uh -huh. I was afraid of those things. They, I'm like they they're sneaky. You can tell they're like in different yeah. areas. They're gonna trap yeah. me in. And I'm gonna be like coyote dinner. Um, yeah. but it never happened. Thankfully, yeah, it didn't happen. Yeah, thankfully. I have yeah, thankfully. Um, no, there's, it's been a, it's been, you know, really interesting to talk to you about these topics. Um, but I do want to bring a little bit of tie in to, you know, kind of the, the people that are out there doing, you know, expeditions or that are, you know, um, involved in wilderness medicine. Um, any lessons you learned kind of from those encounters? Now, certainly you're in a different setting, you're heavily armed. Um, and so, you know, you do have, you know, uh, protection, but anything that, Think you thought were kind of take home messages for um, what to do when you're, you know, encountering wildlife in these kind of settings that you would share with the listeners tonight? Well, the thing I think that um, that worked best, and I remember this is the guy that that told us about the bull, you know, and we debriefed after that. Um, he said something along the lines that you know they can detect. I mean, it's common knowledge that animals can, can detect fear, and so. Um, he said, you just have to like be as calm as possible. And that will 99% of the time kind of just make it a non-issue. And that seemed, that seemed true. I mean, we were more worried about the threat from the enemy. So it wasn't, it was never, I, I can't think of a time when we felt threatened to the point where something had to be dealt with, like, a, a, you know, an animal had to be dealt with over, um, over the mission, but yeah, like the times that, that we did encounter them, even the dogs that came after us in the desert, if we just continue with our business and, and not try to get upset and just, um, after a while they get bored and go off and continue with their lives. That's good. That's good advice. And I, I have to admit, I was thinking as I, you know, was setting this up today to speak to you, um, I was going to try to bring in, you know, what to do when you encounter a bear, but I always forget <laughs> if you're supposed to like 
lay down and play dead or if you're supposed to run the other way or look down. Uh, I know I would probably choose the wrong one um, uh-huh. in that. Yeah. So ho- hopefully neither of us have that encounter um, uh, and have to deal with that. All right. I yeah. think, you know, we're, we're coming close to an end. So I want to ask probably what, you know, the most important question is, like I said, your book was titled uh, Bring Out the Dog. Does mm-hmm. the book answer who, uh, who let the dogs out? <laughs> Um, that's great. That, I that's don't think we've ever. Yeah. Who no, let the dogs I think out? Just, to be answered, and I, yeah, it's I yet to be answered. I don't think it'll ever be answered. It's like the sound yeah. of one clapping. The dogs are out, and that's right. that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I, I was hoping I'd, I'm just finishing up your book, and uh, I was wi- I, I was going to say, oh, I'll just wait to see. Maybe he lets us know, but I guess it'll it won't be known. So <laughs> You'll have fine. to wait till next book. Maybe I'll maybe I'll, I'll figure it out. Next month. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the other thing is, I'm sure a lot of people are, you know, interested in your work. Um, do you have ways to connect with you? Are you on social media at all? Um, Instagram or Twitter or anything of that nature you could share? Or um, No, I'm uh, not. I'm, I'm pretty much a hermit, but I do have a website, uh, wmackin.com. That's W-M-A-C-K-I-N.com. Mm-hmm. And people who want to write to me, there's a, there's a link there to drop me an email. And I respond to everybody. Um, and I love getting emails and having conversations. So yeah, that's, great, that's great. the best way. Thank you. And people can connect um, with you through the uh, Harvard Radcliffe Institute website as well and read a little bit more about your work there. That's yeah, true. Great. Yes, I do have a, a presence there as well. Mm-hmm. Great. Um, any other closing thoughts you wanted to, to leave us with? No, just thank you for inviting me and uh, thanks to you and your audience for the work you do. It's uh, incredible. I was reading up on your website. And like I said, you know, if uh, there's any, ever a time when I can get involved, then uh, I'm going to be back in touch with you and see, you know, what contribution, little little as it may be, I can make. It just sounds like a Absolutely. It takes, it takes, it takes all types. It takes all yeah. types. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, the people that, that gather here uh, – you know, many of them are clinicians, but many are not. And it's just people who have a love of, you know, expeditions, austere mm-hmm. environment, you know, uh, and, and uh, things of that nature. So um, I want to, again, thank you so much for joining me. It was great to talk to you. Um, you know, it's a, it's a really interesting and unique experience that you describe. Um, I think, you know, many of us who work in that, you know, in the, in the field can relate to both positive and negative encounters. Um, and many of us, you know, think about um, conservation um, and think about these topics in and around, you know, live tissue. Um, so it's really, you know, kind of important um, areas for discussion. Um, I, for our listeners, I want to make sure that you, uh, if you already aren't involved, uh, make sure that you go to our website, www.wem, so worldwide web dot, uh, world extreme medicine dot academy. Um, you'll have many resources available there, including these podcasts. Um, you'll have information about our live programming, about our fellowship, about um, you know, some of the other training opportunities and even uh, job opportunities in extreme medicine and austere medicine. We have a lot of great people involved in, in this program and in, in, in uh, world extreme medicine. Um, there's something for everyone there, be it you know, poisonous mushrooms, to you know, shark attacks, to tick bites, to polar um, expeditions, or something there for everybody. Um, so again, thank you, uh, Will, for joining us. Thank you uh, to our listeners. Um, we're uh, uh, happy to have uh, had you join us tonight, and uh, I hope that you have a good rest of the day. Uh, and I'll sign off from there. Yeah, thank you, Steve. It was my pleasure, and uh, great talking to you.